Please join me in welcoming to the stage Lauren Lapkiss. Yay, hi. <laughs> I'm glad you guys all enjoyed that so much. I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about how the film was pitched to you because it wasn't a traditional sense of just reading a script. Yeah, I mean, um, I have worked with Scott Aukerman a bunch over the last few years and I knew they were gonna make this movie and um, I auditioned for the role and it was um, really an improvised audition. The first audition I just went in and w read with uh, a few improvisers that the casting directors brought in and just had us do a few scenarios, just improvised. And then I came back to do it with Zach and we just improvised a couple scenarios, but that was it. I mean, it was really like that loose and the movie itself was 80% improvised. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how much of the overall narrative structure and arc that we see did they have mapped out? Cause, or did that just change drastically from the initial yeah, conception? Yeah, the, the plot was there, just the simple premise that Will told him he could make a TV, have a TV show if he made 10 episodes. So there, it was planned to be a road trip movie where he goes across the country finding 10 people to make um, episodes with. But really, uh, all of the little things that happened between our characters were found on the fly. And a lot of it was like discovered through other improv scenes where we would talk about something and then we would later, OK, let's shoot that and we'll add that into the script. So it was really fun to get to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also really interested in how that led into what you knew about your character and how much direction Scott gave you on who Carol was and how she was fitting into the rest of the characters on screen. Yeah, it started with a very simple, um, just like a character breakdown that you get for any audition where just that, you know, she really cares about Zach and wants to help him make the best show she can, you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. But um, finding all the weird nuances, it was all stuff that we found through improv on the day. Like we had the first probably the first week was all stuff that you will never see that we improvised and shot. That was um, <laughs> a waste of time. Um, <laughs> no, it was really fun. <laughs> and we got to discover a lot about our characters in that improv too. I mean, we didn't, we didn't know what would end up being used or not used, but Scott had the idea to have us come together and, and do full, just scena random scenarios. Like I, Zach and I were just in the stock room and he's asking me where he can find pens and we just improvise for 30 minutes. And you know, that is like my dream come true even if no one ever sees it. So it was awesome, but it does help you discover a lot about the character through that. Cause you can just, well, how is Carol gonna react to all of these little moments? And yeah. what were some of the specific things that you discovered about her and her relationship with Zach through that? Um, one of the things that we ended up shooting was I, when I when we first shot my scene where I'm coming in and you meet my character for the first time with the big computer, um, I improvised that I draw everything that he has to do that day. And so <laughs> then Scott was like, okay, let's see you doing that so we can cut to that. And so that was really cool because as an improviser, you don't get to do that on stage. I mean, you can cut to things, but it's not the same as actually seeing it you know, with practical props and costumes and all that cool stuff. So that was neat. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it was uh, just those, yeah, those little moments like that, I guess I trailed off, but you got what I'm saying. <laughs> and did the two of you kind of want to think very much about what their previous working history had been? Because it's so fascinating watching the way that you two bounce off of each other on screen in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think there's the understanding that she's been there the whole time, over, like for as long as you know you can conceive within the last 11 years. I guess it, it might have been starting young, but um, <laughs> to work for him immediately, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have the a sort of familial relationship. There's like a deep bond there that keeps her wanting to work for him. So there has to be some backstory there that, yeah. that ties her to him or she would strangle him. <laughs> and I think that was something we, we had to find in a lot of the scenes because since we were improvising, you know, my natural tendency with him would be to be like, you're so fucking annoying, you know? Like, and then we'd be like, oh, okay, pull that back. Cause she would never say that. And she needs to love him and be like the positive force in his life. Yeah. And since obviously Carol's coming into Zach's world, were you kind of coming into it as a performer thinking about his tone and his comedic approach and how you would fit into that world? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the character of like Zach's character is such a, a such a you know nut job. He's like always saying and doing the wrong thing, and you're trying. And as Carol, as his assistant, you know, the role is to manage that and keep it in line. So it is everything I did was a reaction to what he's doing, and it has to be. Or like you know, the it the his character doesn't work as well for a long film without some people around him who aren't yeah. hating him. <laughs> 
I also felt like one of the things that was really refreshing about watching their relationship on screen, which I don't know if you found this, was just that there's never any romantic inclination, which I loved always it. happens. Yeah, yes, I thought that was wonderful, and it was I, it was definitely purposeful on Scott's end, like that this was not going to be a romantic storyline. And I thought that was really great because it just, it's first of all, it's realistic that someone would work for him and not fall in love with him. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. and that's just true everywhere, you know, but um, in life. Um, People but, manage it every day. Yes, I go to work all the time and don't fall in love with every man that I encounter. <laughs> so it's actually very rare. Um, so yeah, it's cool that it doesn't happen in this movie. Um, but it was so purposeful and I think it really helps the dynamic as well, that it's not just that she's fueled by like a crush because it's so simple. And I mean, it can work in so many different formats and storylines and stuff. But with this specifically, like, you want to feel like there's something deeper there um, carrying it and not just like, oh, wow, I'm in love with him and I want him to like me. And that's why I'm being nice. And that's why I care about him. Yeah. And obviously getting to improv against Zach and Will Ferrell, who are you know amazing at yeah. that. What were some of the things that you learned from working with them and getting to play against them both in scenes? Oh, my God. They both commit so hard. And that's I mean, it was amazing to be in scenes with them and watch them because I I break so much and I can't help it. But um, especially with people like that, where it's like they're just the funniest people. I've you know always thought that watching them and things, but then to be in the same room and playing against them, it's like you have to work really hard to yeah. focus. Um, but yeah, I think that was the main thing. Zach is like an incredible physical comedian and so much of the stuff, I mean, you know, there's a lot of it in the movie and a lot that you don't get to see, but that was something that really blew me away was being in a scene with somebody who's committing to throwing themselves, you know, all over the room and not caring if they get hurt. And he never complained about any pain, but he fell a lot. <laughs> so I'm very impressed by that. It's like, that's just so cool to watch people commit really hard. Yeah, and I read that you broke quite hard during the Matthew McConaughey water explosion. Scene. Yeah, yeah, all of that was really, I mean, it's it, that's insane. <laughs> like we were shooting, that scene was um, where we're flying down the hallway with the water. <laughs> Was, it was really neat because it was a, a replica of the hallway. So it was already a fake version of that hallway, but then it was tilted. So it was like the whole floor was on an angle and they had this gigantic thing of water that would dump on us. And I had a stunt double who did the big fall and rush around the corner because I probably would have died <laughs> very easily. Um, but I was wait the, the takes where it was me. We know we were just waiting at the end of the hall for this water to come rushing at us. It was really terrifying. Um, but then at the end of it, yeah, Zach stands up and has the ferns and keeps falling and like slipping on them and like crying about it and he can't believe it and he's falling and I'm just like in the corner like <laughs> drowned rat like trying not to laugh and don't want to ruin it. Yeah, it was great. And obviously for a scene like that, everything's gonna be very specifically mapped out with where you're gonna be standing, where yeah. the camera's gonna be. But I imagine it's a lot less like that the rest of the film. So how much are you thinking about where's the camera gonna be, where do I need to be compared to a traditional film or TV show? Yeah, it was kind of cool because it's like mockumentary style. They wanna be able to capture everyone doing whatever they would be doing. And that meant that we were kind of allowed to be doing our own thing in, in the background of any scene. And I really appreciated that because it, it also just helps you feel like it's more real and get into it. You, know, you can get into it more when you're not thinking about your mark everywhere you move. Um, but that's another fun thing about the movie that a lot of the storylines were cut down for the plot's sake, but there you can look in the background and see like, like storylines that were cut because um, Ryan and Giovanni's characters, Cam and Boom Boom, they have a romance that happens throughout the film. And now it's just like snippets of them like sitting close together. And like, they're, like they're, there was a whole story about them hooking up that was supposed to be happening. But yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what's cool about it is that we all had our own agendas in the background of everything. And um, yeah, it wasn't as mapped out or specific. I think, yeah, that water scene was one. Anything that had like a big moment that had to be caught in a certain way was really planned out, but so much of it was loose. And I wanted to kind of ask how like Scott and Zach were helpful for, to you finding those moments, finding what the comedic beats were that were really going to work in a scene since they'd been so entrenched in this show and what it was supposed to be for so many years. Yeah, I mean, they were really free with letting us discover uh, things for our own characters. And, and there were so many moments where, you know, Scott was looking to have real conversation happening between us that could be possibly edited in. And so, uh, like I said, so much of it isn't in the movie, but 
we got to kind of come up with our own premises. Like, okay, we're at this. We would just get a location. Like, okay, we have the bakery to shoot in today, so let's do as much as we can in this bakery. And so, you know, we have like full conversations about picking out eclairs for like a long time. <laughs> and I mean, that was really cool. Like, it was a very cool freedom that you don't usually get on movies. There's usually a very tight plan and we did not have that <laughs> and since you'd worked with Scott so much before was there a really natural shorthand with him being your director yeah yeah I mean we yeah we've worked together doing comedy bang bang and other things over the years and have spent a lot of time like touring and doing stuff together so I did feel that but it's also funny because when you know someone really well like it's it, there's there's that feeling of like I don't, I don't know if it's like that I'm not as, it's not as serious or something, because it's like I know him, but I, there were times where he would be like, you need to focus. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is real. <laughs> what were some of the things that were really fun to, to watch him discover and learn about directing on the film? Oh, wow. Um, I, it's kind of, it was kind of cool, because I think even though he is, in, it was his first movie that he's directed, and he's talked openly about how he was figuring a lot of it out on the fly, it didn't feel that way as much in the moment. And I mean, I think it's, um, that can attribute that to like the great crew that we had. Everyone was really incredible and our DP was so amazing. And uh, I've really learned from the movies that I've done that DPs have like such an important role and they, and they shape so much of what's happening on the day. Um, and they probably don't get enough credit for it. So that was really um, cool to see how that, that dynamic worked and how it, how it helped him. But I mean, I felt kind of unaware of any struggles that he had. I really didn't know. Yeah, yeah which and I think is good. <laughs> and since the crew are, to some degree, your live audience when you're doing something like this, do you look to them much to kind of see what they're responding to, what they're laughing to very silently, hopefully? Yes, yeah, and it was always really great to have those laughs because you need them. I mean, like when you're doing any sort of comedy, and that's the one, the marker that it's going well is like anybody not being able to like hold back their laughter and the, it was really helpful to have the crew there because they also didn't they didn't know what we were going to say or do and I think that was stressful to them on some level because they <laughs> had to plan things and we were like eh, we might talk over here and like they're like we light the room based on where you are um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah I think it was it was fun for them too to see where it went yeah. yeah and how much at the end of the filming when you wrapped did you have a sense of what the final film was going to be like because of how much footage you all shot yeah I really had no idea and it, <laughs> doing improv like I've, I've done it for so long and my brain works in that way like where I can easily forget what I just did or said <laughs> because you just have to move on and stay in the moment with, with an improv and um, so I forgot so much of what we shot like moments after it was done so that when it by the time I got to see the movie like almost a year later It was all a surprise. So that was great <laughs> And yeah, I mean, I'm, I think we've, we've kind of have talked amongst ourselves about like the scenes that were cut and I keep remembering things I'm like, oh that would have been so cool. We did like a whole talent show in a hotel room for each other like we prank called Zach from one hotel room to another and like it was like a whole thing like I just wish people could see it but it's somewhere in the world. I'm curious if there's any sort of like linear correlation in the way that you think about going into an audition room where you know that that footage is never going to go anywhere that it's really just existing in that moment to how you are on set when you know that it's improv and a lot of it's going to end up on the cutting room floor. Yeah I mean I think with auditions it took me a long time to get to that state of mind like it I didn't equate it to improv at all until maybe like the last couple years of auditioning where I would, it, I now feel like I can leave it in the room and just go home and not, you know, hit myself the whole way. <laughs> but for a long, I mean, I still have those, but for a long time it was like every audition was like so important and like if I messed it up, I would be thinking about it forever. So I feel like I could take some of those improv skills and, and help myself in those in that field as well, but it's hard. Were any of the cast on set new to improv? And if so, did that change the way that you played off against them in scenes? Yeah, I don't think so. I think Scott cast, I think everyone in the movie is an improviser. Um, and then the celebrities are the people where it's more of a crapshoot, but they were so down that it, which was really cool to see how willing they were to like be silly and go along with it or get made fun of, which it, a lot of people can't handle. So yeah. <laughs> that was kind of awesome. But yeah, the, the whole cast down to the people with like, you know, teeny, moments are all great improvisers that should have had you know all the screen time I mean everyone is really funny yeah. yeah and I know that Scott would give all of the celebrity cameo people some sort of speech so that they knew what they were walking into they know what tone to expect because we're only seeing a fraction of, of what goes on on screen what are some of the things that 
would be important to, for them to be told beforehand? Um, that if you don't like something, we don't have to use it. You can just say you can't use that, um, and that <laughs> if if something goes too far, we don't even you don't even have to respond. Um, yeah, things like and just that it's all a joke, and, and none of this is like meant to upset you. And yeah, I mean, I think it's just to make sure people are on the same page because in the past, when the show before the show was as known. Um, there were some people who didn't know, like, you know, they're on some press tour and they get assigned this show and then they realize it's really cruel. <laughs> so I think it could be really upsetting. So he's learned to like be very explicit about what's happening. Was there anyone in particular that came on set and you were just really impressed with how ready they were to roll with all the punches in the moment? I, honestly, everyone was. I, I really was impressed by everyone. Um, Keanu Reeves is who I like have the biggest you, you know memory about, I guess, because I was so starstruck by him. And he he read a poem that he wrote for his friend, and this was all real. I, it was very he like like read a whole poem that he made for his depressed friend, and he made it into a book for her. And it might be, they're releasing all of the interviews into full episodes, so that might be in there. I hope it is, because it was really wild. <laughs> so amazing. I'm interested on, on some of the side things with your improv and the fact that you still perform very regularly at UCB as part of ASCAT and, and kind of how you feel like that's important to you to keep honing your skill and practicing and especially in front of audiences all the time. Yeah, it's really important. I mean... It, partly because that's my acting background. So for me, that's like taking classes or any or workshops or anything like that. It's how I feel like I'm like still yeah. doing it in the downtime between jobs. And it just feels like creative and fun. I think there's something about, for me, about like getting the laughs from the audience that feels just like, it like keeps me going in my life and also checks me out of whatever um, sad thing I'm worrying about or you know anything in my life that is hard. I think the times that I'm on stage doing improv, I'm really not thinking, you can't be thinking about anything else. So it's been really beneficial to me and therapeutic in that way. Yeah. yeah. And since you are feeding off the audience so much, is there a different thought process when you're doing a live podcast? Because you have a live audience in front of you that you're seeing, hearing, feeling, responding to, but you're also thinking about the person who's listening to their headphones by themselves. Yeah, I think when I'm doing a live podcast, I'm not thinking about the person who's at home. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry if that messes it up for the people who listen yeah. at home, but it's... It, the benefit of doing them live is like usually I'm in a studio and don't get the benefit of the reaction and can't tell what people are enjoying. So doing the podcast, any one of my podcasts live is really gratifying because you can get that feedback and feel like, oh, this ma matters to somebody or they're enjoying it. Um, and that's one of the hard things I think about podcasting is like even if, you know, you get a couple tweets from people that they liked it or, or they didn't like it or whatever. It's like it feels like it goes into the world and there's no response for the most part. Um, so I love to do anything live and even just like this moment of just coming in at the end and hearing laughter at the blooper reel and stuff. It's like, it just feels cool to be like, oh yeah, people like will laugh at the movie. Like it just, it's nice. <laughs> and when you started creating your own podcast material, did that make you feel like you had a bit more autonomy over your career? Cause it's so difficult as an actor cause you're always waiting on other people. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that was huge for me to find my own thing and when you're doing improv, there's not a way to like share it on a grand platform. And also like, it's kind of hard to tour with it. I've like, managed to find a way to do that in some capacity, but um, it's not like stand up where you can just go perform any night of the week or like go to all these different cities and have that uh, feedback. And so, and it's also hard. So it's hard to make yourself known as an improviser because um, you're usually part of a big group and uh, so it's been really cool to have my own platform to do my thing and to show people like this is my exact brand of comedy and if you like it that's great so otherwise you would never know if you just see me in like some tv show and then you're like oh she's that guy from that tv show and it's like that's not really how I think of myself at all so yeah and you've been doing your podcast with special guest Lauren Lapkus since 2014 which is a significant amount of time and you have so many amazing guests come on how do you feel like they help you to kind of feed yourself creatively and keep it feeling fresh even after all that time yeah, well, the premise of my show inherently keeps it fresh because the idea is that the guest is the host, so they determine what the show is going to be about, and they come up with a character for themselves and a character for me, and they don't tell me anything until we start recording. So it's just an hour of straight improv, and the idea was really born out of like not wanting to do work, <laughs> but but of course it ends up being a lot of work to improvise for a full hour with something you don't know is going to happen. I mean, it's it's kind of like a mixed bag of looking like it's unplanned but also takes a lot of energy mentally um but yeah i mean uh i lost track of your question <laughs> it, 
it was kind I of was about explaining the premise in case people here didn't know what it was. It was but really yeah. about how having different guests and co-stars come onto it really keep it fresh, especially because oh, yeah. at this point you've had a lot of people who've been return guests as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, that's the fun part is that it's always fresh for me because I don't know what they're going to come in with, and people sometimes worry like, "Oh, have you done one about what I'm going to say?" And I'm like, "It just doesn't matter because there's no way it can go the exact same way as that other episode." So it's it's always fresh and interesting. Yeah. Do you find that when someone's been on it before that they sometimes see it as a little bit of a challenge to see just how much further they can keep pushing you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's fun for me. I mean, I, I really like to be like, um, I mean, the term in improv is pimped out where people just like make you do things that you don't necessarily want to do. It's a really fucked up term, actually, now that I'm saying it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and you get paid for it. I need to re I need to figure a new term for that because that's probably like not cool. Um, but yeah, it's it's always like f I think my friends who know me have more even more fun on the show because they know they can take it anywhere, and it, that's my dream is for it to be like way more crazy than you even think it's going to be when you come in. Yeah. And because with all of that and all of your acting roles, you're creating such an impressive number of characters, probably in any given week. I'm really curious about how you kind of go about in, in the world observing people and trying to figure out little things that you can take and use. Oh, yeah. I mean, I really love people watching and just I... I think like I naturally implant it's I find that really fun and just finding little quirks about people or people you're in line with at a store who are being rude or something. Like I just love people who are rude or like unaware, like just in their own world. I think like I, I like people who are not self aware. Um, and most of the characters I like to play are jerks and like horrible. So <laughs> it's a lot more fun because you don't get, I don't walk through my life being an ass. So I like to do it in the podcast or an improv because it's like a world where it's safe. Um, but I love to watch people who are walking through the world like they are the center of it and that's everything and I can do whatever I want and no one will react to me negatively because I'm me and it's like you're the worst person I've ever seen. <laughs> and you're so hands on with it as well even down to the fact that you're editing your own podcasts. What did that kind of teach you going through the process of sitting there and listening to it so intently with so much detail? Oh, that was definitely hard at first because usually when you do an improv show you have there's you forget about it or you might remember one part and and you could even make it out to be better in your head than it was or anything like that so listening to it back uh sometimes I'm pleasantly surprised like oh that was funnier than I thought it was and other times I'm like oh god that well, I thought that was funnier than it was or you know whatever so it can go either way but I usually try not to edit out anything from with special guest unless the guest asks me to cut something specific but um, I try to keep any things that would be deemed mistakes or like weird moments in because I think it's really cool if you are, if you enjoy improv or you're curious about improv to watch something kind of maybe tank for a second but then get saved because um, it's one of the cool things about it. It teaches you that like no, nothing really matters in a good way. Like you can always fix things. Yeah. Were there any moments shooting between two ferns where you have a scene where you feel like you were kind of not hitting the mark and it felt like a little bit of a fail in the moment, but it allowed you that creative freedom to to find the right spot? Oh, it's I, honestly, and like I feel bad because I can't remember yeah. so much of them. <laughs> so I can't really answer that, but I, I'm sure that I had that. I mean, there's, I think with, especially in the amount of improv that we were doing, like there are always going to be moments where it kind of sucks or it feels bad or it's just... You're not finding it together, um, but but I think that's one of the cool things about it is that it it's first of all you're failing with other people when you fail, so it's not just yourself, and you can't be you know you try not to beat yourself up too much about it, but um, being able to kind of find something cool at the end of it and go oh it's actually cool that we messed that up because then it made this make sense later and yeah. yeah. When you're thinking about taking a project because you need that feeling of trust to feel comfortable enough to experiment and to, to fail to succeed, do you pay attention to just the project that you're doing or do you really think about the people that are going to be around you to make sure that it's going to be that environment for yourself? Mm, in terms of this movie specifically? or This movie, but just in general, like how you're thinking about the people that you're going to be working with day to day, whether it's the director or the other cast that you're going to be playing against and something. Yeah, I mean, I think you really want to have a safe environment where people allow you to fail I mean I think it would this movie would have been a lot harder if Scott like the, the if the director didn't have the experience with improv to know that like we will get something good um because I think some people could be scared of it and want to back off really quickly if it doesn't seem to be going well right away 
But that was what was cool with this because we got to have that time, like the first week or so of really just messing around with each other and finding things together that it was really special to be afforded that to like do things that wouldn't be used, but it was still useful. Um, and yeah, I think anything that I make, I really like to have a, a, the whole crew and everyone be people who are on board and like down for the, the mess of it too. <laughs> Is there anything from when you first took improv classes that you remember learning on like that first day or one of the first few weeks that you were diving into all of this that is a lesson that still kind of sticks with you that comes into play in your head? Absolutely. That The message, I think, is that everybody has something to say. Because I, when I first started improv, I was in high school and I was taking classes with people who were in their 20s. And to me, that seemed like this huge difference in life and it is I mean when you're in high school versus when you're 24 like you've 24 year olds don't think they're on the same level as a high schooler um and they're not but I and I was like really worried that I was going to be really boring to them or that like I would have nothing I have nothing to pull from in my life because I'm too young or whatever and that can mean so many things for different people as to why they think they don't have something to say um but taking improv classes really helped me realize that like everyone's voice is valuable and there's always something interesting. Like I, I would like to hear from a high schooler now. I'm curious what they're going through. And yeah. so, yeah, I, at the time, I think I was just too down on myself to see that, but yeah. it's hard to know. And a lot of your early work was also working in commercials and I'm curious kind of what you learned about just being on a set day to day that is really helpful when you walk onto a film set or a TV set today. Yeah, I think commercials were a really great training ground to kind of be pushed into something because like they you have to nail it and it's a lot of pressure I remember the first commercial I did I had just I only had to say two words animal house that was like it was being dot com commercial and I it's like where people just say non sequiturs in a room and I was doing it so much that I started saying different words <laughs> and it was like not hard it's like I'm only supposed to say two things and it was so much pressure, but I thought that was really great because it taught me, I didn't know anything about being on a set or anything like that. And like, I was really nervous for every commercial that I did, but it it just shows you like, okay, well, first we're gonna get it. We're gonna get through it. They have this time. They're not gonna stop until you do it right. Um, which is nerve wracking, but also cool. Yeah. yeah. And when you were going up for Orange is the New Black, I know that you did a self tape audition mm -hmm. for that. Kind of, is there a different approach and process that you think about when it's just you in the room? And how do you reach that point where you feel like, this is the version that I want to send in. I've got this. <sighs> it's so hard. I think self tapes are like punishment because, <laughs> It's awful, like you have you have all the time in the world, but like I don't wanna spend all the time in the world doing this thing that I probably won't get. So I'm like, yeah. it's it's awful. <laughs> I have to figure out lighting. I have to get someone to do it with me. It's like, I'm gonna fight them. Like this is gonna happen. Like, <laughs> especially if you're in a relationship with them, like you'll probably get in a fight during it. Yeah. It's just like, it's awful. <laughs> I'd rather drive an hour and go to an audition and have it go poorly than do all of that. So I hate self tapes, but I do feel like I, I have booked a handful of things off of them and it, it's partly because you can watch it back and see yourself and go, oh, I didn't like that. And normally you don't get that luxury of watching it back and knowing what was weird about your performance or what you would do differently. So it's really helpful in that sense. And I mean, for that role, I didn't even know anything about the show. It wasn't a show yet. And it was like Netflix didn't even have streaming series at the time. So I had no sense of what I was auditioning for and I didn't really understand what a corrections officer was either. I thought I was like a detective or something. So <laughs> my audition was, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I, you know, obviously I got it. So I think I did a good job, but like I was coming into it really blind. And um, yeah, I mean, it, having that time is like helpful, but also a curse, it's weird. And how did you approach coming back into the show in season seven? Because you were in the first two, and then essentially for five years, you went off and did yeah. a bunch of other things. And then you had to revisit this character and play her in a way that felt like she had existed for that entire time. Yeah, it was kind of nerve wracking because I, first of all, like I hadn't been with the family of the whole cast and everyone in a long time. And I was kind of nervous about coming back into it and hoping that it would be fun. And it was, it was really cool. I mean, one of the things that was kind of neat about it was that the one of the guys who was a cameraman, the seasons that I was on was then directing the episode that I was in seven, five seasons later. So that was cool to watch. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I just wanted to do right by the character. The show has so many fans who are like really obsessed with it um, beyond what I can comprehend. So I didn't want to mess it up. And so I felt a bit of pressure coming back and wanting to do a good job. But it's just a quick scene too. So it's, it's hard. It's like a hard thing to put on yourself. So really, I just try to just do it. <laughs>
<laughs> it's not great advice, I guess. You Nike. did a great job with it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also interested when you're coming into TV shows on the opposite end of the spectrum that have already existed for several seasons. So whether you're coming into something like The Big Bang Theory, where you're coming in for a full story arc, or you're coming into something like Luther, where you're just coming in for an episode, how you would approach those two different things and the way that you want to build up your character for yourself before you set on step step onto set for the first yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, with Big Bang Theory, my character was supposed to just be in one episode and they ended up making it a recurring character. So that's a cool surprise, but um, I was, so I wasn't really able to prepare for that, but I I did want to just do a good job on that show because it is such a well-oiled machine that like, you don't want to slow it down. And so I came into it feeling like I want to be very prepared and especially with multicam, I'm always extremely prepared with my lines and I, cause you can't really improvise. There's no room. The cameras are going at a very specific speed and everything is like, has to happen at a certain time. And they're working with very, like 21 minutes only. So there's really no time to mess around. Um, but my, one of my first jobs was multicam. So I really kind of like that pressure. Um, but yeah, I, I, and, and in terms of preparing, there's not much I could do It's more just like, Oh, I, uh, Oh, they're going to ask me back. Okay, great. <laughs> so yeah, it was neat, but yeah. Would you say that, um, being so involved in improvising has also helped you to kind of navigate the industry in general because it's such an unpredictable lifestyle. With improv, you said? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do think so. I mean, I think I kind of thrive on not knowing what's gonna happen next, so I that really works out because I never have any clue. <laughs> and right now I have no idea, so I'm in that zone again, and it's it's cool, like I think, there, you have to be you have to be at peace with that as an actor because it feels really restless. If like you can get really restless if you don't know what's going to happen next, and you never will. Um, even people who are on long running series, like the, eventually comes to an end, and you have to have something in mind for what you want to do or how you keep yourself going. And I mean that's why podcasting is so great, or just making your own things. I recently made a short film, and that was so fulfilling because it was like, oh, I just did it, and I put all my funny friends in it, and we didn't have to wait for someone to say I could, and that was so awesome. Like. That keeps me going, and I try to keep myself like creative and coming up with new ideas all the time to, I don't know, not get upset about not having a job. <laughs> and then I also just wanted to ask you, kind of going back to Between Two Ferns, being on the other side of it and being out in the world, what do you feel like you learned the most about your craft from being part of this whole project? Oh, I think it just, again, I think it was just another lesson in commitment and how helpful that is um, in every job because... It really, in doing an improvised movie, it's like if you're not committing, it's just really not gonna work, but it does translate over to acting as well, that like any any part of you that's thinking about something else while you're doing it is taking away from your performance. So that was another lesson that I definitely hit home with, yeah. And what part of your involvement in the film are you proudest of looking back at it now? Oh, wow. Um, I, I didn't have anything to do with my costumes, but that's one of the main things. <laughs> um, but I think just just uh, getting to improvise on screen, it's so cool to be able to share that with people. I think it, it's so rare that we get to see something like that. And I mean, I'm, I've lived in Chicago, New York and LA and done improv in those cities. And those cities know about improv, but like, you know, most of the world doesn't. So it's cool to get to share it. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing film. It's so fun and so well done. And your thank performance you. is amazing. Thank you so much for coming and sharing yeah, with us thank tonight. You. And it is out on Netflix now. So please share with all of your friends. Thanks so much. <laughs>